My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Watch Out for Fireballs, that is a Games Club podcast. And this week we're talking about XCOM 2, which is a strategy game developed by Firaxis and published by 2K Games for the PC and consoles in 2016. Yeah, and this was executive produced by Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Thank, thank you, Joseph. I love this game. Yeah, oh yeah. This this is uh, this is my favorite game I played this year. Mm-hmm. Um, which you know is hard because it's beaten out Lunacid, Sir Valadro, Bronte, Sir Bronte, Shadow of the Air Tree. Like, yeah, this is. Uh, I knew we would get to this for work, so I didn't play it because mm-hmm. uh, I knew I'd love it. Yeah, and I do. It's um, <laughs> yeah, it's real special, and we really loved the first XCOM game when we covered it four yeah. years ago, four and a half years ago, something like that. Um, uh, you know, we really, uh, I don't know. This is this is just that and more it, in terms of being systems rich and having everything feed into itself. Yeah, I like this. I like this one better than that. Yes. That one. Which is hard to do. And someday we'll do Chimera Squad, which is also quite good in its own right. Yeah. And, and, so, then, and then XCOM the Bureau. Uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> Midnight kidding. Suns. Yeah. Yep. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. It's a, I, I, for access. Yep. What a company. Uh, this is a two part episode, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, two really long episodes. Mm-hmm. Because th- this game weirdly has six story missions, basically. <laughs> um, it just has tons of systems. Yes. Uh, and it took a long time to play. My play clock was like 50, 55 hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't rush it. You know, I did side stuff, but it was still a long time. Yeah. Um, so in this first episode, we're going to be talking about systems. Right. System, system, systems. Next episode, mission types, enemies, stuff like that. Right. Uh, we'll see how it, how it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll be talking about systems and then like, you know, the, included in that is obviously the combat stuff, but also, uh, your soldiers, the different, different ways you can train them up, different facilities in your base, and then the vastly expanded and improved, uh, strategy layer. Yes. Yeah. No longer are you beholden to satellites. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is a sequel to XCOM Enemy Unknown and its expansion, Enemy Within. We covered both of those in one episode, foolishly, back yes. in 2020. That's episode 267. That's a premium episode. Yes. Uh, and this is a kind of an alternate reality mm-hmm. uh, in this one. Um, this takes place that with the, uh, the game assuming you lost yeah. the first game. Um, canonically, you didn't with things that came later. No. That, that is why this is considered, considered an alternate timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just like to think of it as an alternate future here for this. Yeah. Um, in this game, aliens, uh, you know, we lost the war. Aliens took over the Earth and they formed something called Advent yeah. uh, with the government, um, which is kind of a union. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of like a half slave state, you know, beautiful uh, dystopia that, uh, you know, kind of works for people and kind of does not. Right, because it is totalitarian and people are being experimented on. And ultimately, throughout the course of the game, we learn what is going to be the real fate of regular humans. Um, yes. Yeah, so y- you, the player character, the commander, you were captured uh, in the uh, war that went wrong. Uh, and the remnants of XCOM spent the intervening 20 years trying to recover you. Uh, and yes. now you're back and you're leading a scrappier XCOM, uh, as they fight against Advent and kind of rally this global resistance. Yeah. It does tons for mm-hmm. the tone and feeling of this to be a resistance yes, and be a, uh, a rebellion as opposed to a defense, mm-hmm. um, to this. This is one of those stock stories that will work for me. Oh yeah. Like, you know, just kind of, it, it's half-life, mm-hmm. you know, it's basically half-life too. Yeah. Uh, as a thing, like everyone kind of coming together to to shake off this kind of yoke mm-hmm. uh, is one of the only times I can feel like an Earth pride. Right. <laughs> when we talked about Mass Effect, you know, Earth felt like a stand in for the United States to me, not yes. least of which because everybody who was from Earth was, you know, spoke English mm-hmm. and everything here. It doesn't feel like that. Um, and there are a lot of little touches we'll get to that make this feel like a coalition of countries all around the world. Mm-hmm. Like this has a great feeling of unification to it. Yes. Um, the main thing you're trying to do is stop something called the Avatar Project. Um, and the main story is about discovering what Advent is, what the Avatar Project is, and figuring out how to stop it. Right. 
Um, and <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that, that's the majority of what you're doing. Uh, we'll talk about more of the story next episode. Um, because of the way this series incorporates as expansions into, into the main game, uh, we're going to be talking about the confidence systems included in uh, the war of the chosen, uh, because those are just, just, just interweaved right in. Um, uh, other more minor DLC, the alien hunters, uh, Shen's legacy, Shen's um, last gift. Shen's last gift, yes. Um, <laughs> that stuff gets included in the game in strange ways that do not involve doing any of the story missions for it. Uh, so we will talk about like the alien rulers or whatever, and, uh, as many of them as we encountered next episode. But there are like actual missions that you do to like go after their HQ and stuff that we just didn't yeah. see because if you click the box to include that stuff in the main game, um, you, you know, it just it doesn't include that. No, it, it integrates the features from it. Yes. You know, so, so we also had, you know, spark units, for yeah. example, that were part of Shen's last gift as a DLC. Uh, those that is just it's part of the game. That we did mm-hmm. when you when you fire this up this is a weird game it's similar to like playing um hitman 2016 yeah and the sequels now where you're trying to figure out exactly which version <laughs> you're playing and what to have included mm-hmm. you know uh there's just a button that says incorporate war of the chosen and dlcs we click yeah. that yeah yeah uh so if you if those missions with shen's last gift and the alien hunters are very cool sorry that we're gonna miss them they just literally didn't pop up yeah uh and you know 55 hours i wasn't gonna do it again yeah, right so, in about them in uh, the dispatch at the end of the month or by the 15th yeah. of this month if uh, those are especially cool to you. Yes. Um, let's talk about development. Yeah. Uh, so Jake Solomon, the uh, director of the uh, kind of the original reboot, you know, somebody who loved the ones, the games from back in the 90s uh, and got hired by Firaxis to kind of reimagine them for modern modern systems. Uh, him and his team returned to make XCOM 2 uh, with development beginning after they shipped Enemy Within. Yeah. Uh, and this development was much quicker and smoother. Uh, than what they had done previously because they use a lot of existing tools. Also, they knew what they did. You know, they, they knew that they built an audience for what they were making mm-hmm. and they knew uh, what they wanted. Right. You know, um, this is not a huge graphical upgrade or even at least on the tactical layer, a huge gameplay upgrade mm-hmm. from the first one. In many ways, this is just more XCOM. Yeah. Um, you know, there are differences that make this better, I think, that make it worth playing, but it mm-hmm. is more XCOM. Yes. And that is perfectly fine. In fact, it wasn't more XCOM enough in the original <laughs> in the original mm-hmm. version. Uh, and the War of the Chosen fixed that and kind of won a lot of fans back. Um, yeah. Uh, choosing to set this in the alternate timeline uh, was a part of an effort to reboot the series again, figuring how do you do a sequel like, oh, the aliens are back <laughs> after we yeah. defeated them soundly. <laughs> yeah. Try uh, again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This also brings the tone more in line with the darker games of the original series. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the story and saying changes, you know, placing this new emphasis on guerrilla warfare, let them lean further into the choices they wanted to make for squad based combat. Yeah. Um, one of the things that a couple of people have asked, you know, they've been like, oh, these games sound interesting. Where should I start? And that's a really interesting question because even though I do think XCOM 2 with War of the Chosen is better, uh, you will appreciate it more having played the first one. Yes. Uh, this game is one of the sequels that I think is most in conversation with the first game. Yeah. That we've done. Mm hmm. Um, you know, it's them listening to feedback, you know, from the first game, of course, like they, they changed some map design, things like that, but they also change the way you play, mm-hmm. uh, specifically with that. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so like one of, one of the things, uh, that relates to the development there, uh, is the fact that in XCOM one, the maps are very well designed, handcrafted lovingly. Uh, <laughs> uh, however, there are only so many of them. You do end up defending the same gas station quite a bit. I love that gas station. I will fucking die for that gas station. Those x-rays are not getting my gas, dude. No. <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> um, so they had intended to use procedural generation of maps in Enemy Unknown, uh, but it just wouldn't fit in the timeline. Brought in too many problems, so they just designed a bunch of maps by hands. People complained about that repetition. 
mm-hmm. saying, hey, things get kind of boring on the tactical layer uh, after a while. Um, so they worked really hard this time to make procedural generation work, and it does. You can kind of yeah. see the seams where it's like, okay, a building goes here. We're going to randomize what building goes here. But I don't know. Because everything in this operates at the details, the differences in those details matter. Yeah. Yeah. I, it never bothered me. No. During this. You know. uh, most of the development, they're aiming for a simpler, easier game. Uh, but testing showed the players actually want something harder. Yeah. Uh, people who like this type of video game are sickos, generally. <laughs> um, and this is more apparent in the original version of the game. Um, War of the Chosen was a big step in terms of making things more challenging and unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, and it's brutal, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, Hard this game. is a game where you can uh, completely scrap, you know, a 50-hour campaign 30 hours into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, le- seems less likely to me, though, in XCOM than in XCOM 1. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting, um, largely because of the strategy layer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are given um, a lot more levers to pull mm-hmm. to in order to make spinning your plates easier. Yes. And Noah will not be elaborating on that. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, that makes perfect sense. Well, yeah. we, we will be elaborating over <laughs> yeah. the course of this no, episode, I probably. I just, <laughs> I just liked how esoteric that, that sounded. Yeah. But it's, you know, I made it reference to satellites. That is what fucks you in the first one yeah that's true yeah you just don't make enough satellites and you can get a hard game over i would find it a lot more difficult to get a hard game over in this game yes yeah um uh, (laughs) relating to the development uh there's a lot of voice acting in this game lots of different characters and you really feel happy for these dorks because they got to cast damn near everybody from star trek the next generation who wasn't uh it wasn't patrick stewart yeah, all the non Picards uh, got in. It's it's the uh, I didn't know that going into this, uh-huh. and the creeping sense of familiarity uh, of each one, and then putting them together was great. Like I was like, oh oh, you know, that's definitely John Delancey. John Delancey is very easy to clock. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then just like, oh, John, okay, Jonathan Frakes. I think that is Jonathan Frakes yeah, or somebody yeah. doing a good impersonation. Character you know? looks kind of like him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Oh oh. Okay, okay, yeah, that's kind of Troy coded, you know, and then just having this uh, like subtle feeling being surrounded at a party. Um, you know, the staff are big fans. Um, they're all great voice actors. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like tons, tons of charisma on display mm-hmm. with these voice actors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, something that has added to the longevity of the series is the mod scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, really propped up a lot of stuff from XCOM uh, Enemy Unknown. Um, they decided uh, to emphasize that in this. So mod support was worked into the actual development. They brought on board uh, the developers of the massive um, XCOM The Long War mod, mm-hmm. uh, kind of full campaign conversion. Uh, they were brought on board to kind of help create the modding framework and also uh, create some official mods that were available on day one for people who wanted to customize. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the tactical layer specifically, um, very similar to the episode we did on the first game, we're going to structure the discussion just from micro to macro. So yeah. tactical to strategy. Um, both layers are integrated really well, mm-hmm. so it's hard to decide what to hit first, and you'll be doing them interchangeably yes uh you you cannot really focus on one to the detriment of another yeah you know you have to do them both the rhythm of this is super satisfying like i would end um, i would end a combat mission and just be like well i'm just going to advance the timer um and see what i can get because that's where you get your rewards right Mm -hmm. like i'm going to research something i'm going to get all this and then i just i would do that until um uh, until another combat mission showed up you know Mm -hmm. uh, an emergency presented itself yeah until fire broke out and then it's like okay do i continue tonight do i have another uh, 45 minute hour long combat mission in me or do i you know leave this off to start tomorrow and just incredibly compulsive loop that they have built into this i found It's a thing where people have complained about that interface between the two of them, um, of feeling like you're getting interrupted Mm -hmm. a lot. But for me, combat came around when I was ready for some combat. Yeah. And doing my strategy uh, tasks and then setting myself up to start my next session with a a cool fight Mm -hmm. always felt good. Yes. You know, uh, it's something I do in um, Baldur's Gate 3 as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like I try to find a, uh, a, you know, get a hot start on my next session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Most of your time is going to be spent in that tactical layer. You know, in these uh, very long missions, they're difficult, they have high stakes, um, very deadly. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of these rules uh, that were laid out have exceptions that come from skills or equipment. So we're going to talk about them generally, but gen- uh, like any kind of board game or card game, the text of the ability oversees anything else. Yes. You know, it, it does what the, what the skill says. Yeah. So this is more XCOM, you know, remains broadly yes. the same, you know, top-down 
uh, in 3D environments. It's turn-based. Allies and enemies trade turns, meaning that all allies go and all enemies go. Um, you can hop around mid, uh, mid-turn mid as well. So you can have mm-hmm. somebody move, jump over, get somebody else in position, then get back to that original person. There's a lot of freedom within a round to do things in the order that you would like. Yes. Uh, each unit gets two actions per turn. Um, and attacking or using an item or combat skill will automatically end the turn Mm -hmm. with some exceptions. Um, so you want to reload first if you're going to shoot, um, you can, uh, and you want to move first if you're going to move. Yes. Um, cover is back, baby. Uh, this is, God, I I don't know how I do, uh, strat or tactics games without this. Um, yeah. Uh, you gain advantage by being in cover, uh, getting behind objects in the environment. There's full and partial cover. Being in cover makes it less likely that you're going to get hit and, uh, you're going to take less damage. Uh, if they end up hitting, uh, leaving somebody completely exposed is a really good way to watch them die the next turn. Yep, uh, they 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 show that very elegantly right in the mm-hmm. tutorial mission. Yeah, um, never have somebody out of cover. Never. Uh, another thing, this is a Gwen tip. Uh, mm-hmm. Gwen was talking about it with somebody else in the Slack, but partial cover is no cover. Uh huh. <laughs> um, that's not quite true, but you really uh, with the stakes and how deadly the combat is in this, um, this rewards playing pretty conservatively mm-hmm. with things like that. At the same time, while pushing you not to play conservatively, yeah. which is like where the the joy comes from. It's an excellent tension. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Um, enemies will move to flank. They're not stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and cover can be destroyed um, either by explosives, special skills. Some bits of cover can be destroyed just by arms fire mm-hmm. uh, through that, uh, depending on the hardness of it. Yeah. Um, and environments are destructible. So you can blow up the floor beneath enemies. You can blow down walls to make shortcuts, things like that. Yeah. Um, that is very satisfying. Ex- uh, <laughs> extremely. When you have an enemy, uh, like an enemy t- uh, force that's kind of uh, entrenched in or like yes. they're, they're, you can see that they're relying on a bottleneck or whatever. And you can just like pick up the board and shake the pieces off and say Go reset. <laughs> yeah. Huge, huge, huge opportunities for lateral thinking. Yeah. You know, and we'll, we'll get into this because uh, everything talks to each other everything mm-hmm. is interconnected in this so it's kind of hard to not go off on tangents but this interface is really interestingly with a stealth system mm-hmm. in this where you are not forced to take the path of most resistance yeah um and you can get around or through things uh that ordinarily would just be parts of the environment mm-hmm. it also has the uh, the great uh, video game thing that trees are indestructible <laughs> um, anything made by man can be destroyed if it were grown grown from a seed Mm-hmm. Uh, it will outlast us all. No weapon forged by man will. <laughs> yeah, or car will harm forged it. by man yeah. can never, or or Batmobile uh-huh. can can destroy anything. Uh, a tree is indestructible. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful in its way. I love that message. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can improve the odds of survival um, by using equipment that has armor pips. Uh, uh, different armor will in- will increase your health that you have, but also armor is kind of it's uh, it's like damage reduction, flat damage reduction, just uh, subtracted from the top. However, armor can be shredded by explosions uh, or particular yes. weapons. Uh, there are exceptions there. Something that is beautiful about this and everything that we have described so far um, is that all of this applies to both sides. Sides. Like yes. uh, many of the units that you have have direct foils um, on the other side, and they are using every of the each one of the same tactics that you have. Yeah, it feels like fair play. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, if you don't attack, uh, you can hunker down, which gives you a bonus to defense. Or uh, one of the signature mechanics of this game, which is Overwatch, mm-hmm. um, you uh, you will shoot the first enemy that moves into your line of sight. Yes, um, this is huge. Mm-hmm. Knowing when to use this, there are characters and there are skills based around this. Mm-hmm. Um, there are advanced skills that let you do this for free. Yep. You know, you'll automatically go into Overwatch at the end of your round, things like that. Um, this is really, really big mm-hmm. because you do not want you want to catch the enemy outside of cover. Yes. Shooting them while they're in cover, you know, not a great proposition. Shooting them while they're moving between cover, mm-hmm. that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fog of war and line of sight are important. If you do not have eyes on an enemy, they are invisible to you. Yes. Um, a big new addition and emphasis in XCOM 2, which befits the kind of guerrilla warfare uh, side of this, is stealth. Um, you begin almost every mission in concealment. Yes. Uh, that means that you can explore. Uh, you have free reign to explore um, and position your units for an ambush. Um, <laughs> there are certain tiles that will have a little eyeball on it. That means the enemy can see you there. The enemy is also still moving around. Yeah. Uh, this. Um, contrast with the first one where enemies just kind of like spawned in. Yeah, you know, you'd get to the pod of them, and then they would all take their places. Mm-hmm. 
uh, here. Now you can keep an eye on them and they will be patrolling. Mm hmm. You know, uh, and you can set up your characters for an advantage, uh, kind of first strike. And if you take them all out, you can stay in, there are certain things you can do to stay in concealment, mm -hmm. um, with that. So you can, you can actually stealth is a viable skill in this. Yeah. And just picture me standing in the, in the middle of the battlefield, conducting a symphony like I'm Willem Dafoe and Boondock Saints, yes. <laughs> like as I, as I set up an ambush and then, you know, d decide what action breaks the, you know, breaks my cover and then just watch every enemy get torn down by all my folks who are in Overwatch. All the, the dominoes you set up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's one of the best feelings. I yeah, love yeah. it. Very few, very few better feelings in video games than, than a successful ambush. Uh, really really good yeah um so you're you're balancing this because if you advance too quickly you need to be able to see the enemy yeah. so you can set these ambushes if you advance too quickly um you might see more enemies and kind of put them on the screen and if concealment is broken you still have the old form of like activating a pod of enemies yes you see a little cutscene of them having a little monster party before you show up <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they all take their places uh, and they automatically get to move into cover yeah uh, if you're not in concealment that's the, the, one of the big differences there yeah um and uh, then still Stealth is not risk-free, right? You can stealth past a group of enemies. If they detect you, then they get to, you know, go and get into cover. You don't like that. Also, if you successfully stealth past a bunch of stuff and then break concealment later, intentionally or accidentally, those guys will still run to you. So you might end up sandwiched or surrounded, right? Kind of depending on the map. Yep. Like, th this is something I found that varied a lot depending on miss mission type. Um, there's one type of mission where you're bombing a facility that I got very good at stealthing. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and could do it basically without very much fighting at all, mm -hmm. um, you know, where I would want to sneak past by but generally you do want to take everybody out. Yeah. Um, your allies, uh, your soldiers can be killed or they can start bleeding out. Mm -hmm. Um, if they're bleeding out, you need to rush them with a healing item to stabilize them or get next to them and mm -hmm. do a, a move. Yeah. Um, and they will remain unconscious for the mission, which means if you want them out, you have to get them out, mm -hmm. uh, there and some enemy attacks will actually just knock, uh, soldiers out. Yeah, and they're they're down for the mission, and you're down two soldiers mm -hmm. when this happens. Uh, you have somebody who has to carry them, and some, and you're out that soldier. Yeah, um, if somebody's unconscious, and it is the kind of mission that just ends when you um, when you clear all the enemies, you're fine. But they're just going to yeah. be uh, kind of regathered. Uh, but if it's anything that requires an evac. You know, getting uh, to, getting back to your uh, little uh, little aircraft or calling it in, um, and you extract everybody but that person, they will be kept as a POW. Yes, yeah. and if you want them back, you can do so. A yeah. mission will pop up, uh, so you can. Uh, it's tough mm -hmm. to break them out. Yeah. Um, there's hacking in this game. Uh, just for a second, I want to camp out on this. If you put a gun to my head. Mm -hmm. I couldn't explain what they were going for with this interface. No, not at all. Uh, it's like Isn't a press it, your luck kind of thing, but... I understand. I I totally get how it works. Yeah. But the way it's visually conveyed is nuts. It's like a little, um, <laughs> little screen pops up on the back of the Gremlin drone, and it zooms in on it. Yeah. And there's a... Uh, so it's three options uh, there. <laughs> um, they're, they're, one of them is the bad option. You don't choose that. And then two preferred op options. So, like, for example, you're hacking an enemy mech. Mm -hmm. Uh Usually pretty easily, you can just stun it. Yeah. If yeah. you want to take control over it, it gives you a percentage chance for that working. Mm -hmm. Anything uh, less than that, though, it will get a buff. And then a little bar moves across the bottom yeah. that does not seem to correspond with anything that's above it. Right. Uh, and just kind of moves at a random speed. Like, I, I understand dice are being rolled. I know uh -huh. what is happening. It's visually conveyed, like, really badly. Extremely badly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you don't just hack enemies, you hack stuff out in the world. Like when you're hacking yes. a door, you can decide like, okay, do I, do I just want to try to open it and it'll set off an alarm? Do I want to, uh, open it and try to suppress the alarm or do I want to get some kind of like advantage on the strategy layer? Right. Yeah. And these are semi-randomized, mm -hmm. uh, kind of interestingly, there are control towers and communication towers. The first time I found one, I hacked it and the options were not good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I don't need to worry about those. And then on a Lark, later I tried it, and I had options that were like, you know, stun two enemy units mm -hmm. or gain control of an enemy unit. Did you did you do it with a different person? Like, did you have two specialists, or was it the same mm -hmm. unit? No, uh, same unit. Oh, it's wow. just different. Uh, so there's a randomized set of what these can be when they spawn. Okay. Um, what options you can get for those communication towers. The, um, the hacking for turrets and robots are always the same. Mm -hmm. The communication towers, you get a mixed grill. 
Yeah. Um, they can put all your whole squad in concealment. It can make the person who is hacking immune to the next two attacks. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of cool things it can do. It's worth checking. Yes. On those. Yeah. Um, and hacking a robot is obviously uh, one of the most powerful things you can do in any kind of tactics game is take control of a unit. Mm-hmm. It's a, a, a swing by two. Yes. You, you, know, you take a unit and gain a unit. Um, that math adds up. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, go see Real Itch Hours, our show where we're talking about Baldur's Gate 3, where a number of our discussions about spells and skills and stuff is about turn economy, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, a really kind of broad change to this uh, is this emphasis on timed missions. Mm-hmm. Um, for Axis, there was a way of playing XCOM 1 that for Axis decided to discourage, which was very conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, this kind of turtling uh, sniper crawl. Yeah, sniper overwatch crawl kind of thing that basically unlocked the game yeah, you know, yeah. they would do terror missions they were called to try to break you out of that but they were rare mm-hmm. um there are a lot more uh missions with timers and stakes yes uh, in this game that stresses some people out you can go into the options and double your time mm-hmm. if you want on them if if that stresses you out i would encourage people listening to this to try it yeah um i ended up really liking it i never ran out of time yeah on a thing i had some close calls but they were i wouldn't trade them for anything they're mm-hmm. really fun uh and it gives they give you enough time yeah and it really raises the stakes right like yes. i i have had some i've had a soldier i really liked left behind because they couldn't get to evac in time yeah. right it just it yeah. just happens i have have to get there or you'll take a dumb risk because you're running out of time mm-hmm. you know and and someone will get wounded or killed yeah um, but you did the mission yeah, you know that that's drama, baby. <laughs> I just want to be forced into making dumb decisions, like yeah, ah, shit, or suboptimal. Yeah, you know, suboptimal. It, it, yeah, real life is made of of suboptimal decisions. Like any type of of strategy or role playing game can be ruined by only making optimal decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is a, a big problem in tabletop gaming as well. Like if your table only wants every character to make every optimal decision every turn, mm-hmm. like you you will miss out on a lot. Yeah, uh, that. Like mm-hmm. failure needs to happen. Yeah, yeah. T- t- turns every dungeon run into six or seven shitty sleepovers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> failure is fun. Yes. Like in in video games, like you embrace this feeling that it is okay to be made. You know, in in good stories and good drama, mm-hmm. bad things happen. Yeah. And if you uh, <laughs> turn your characters, if you name them after your friends and design them to look like your little friends or you know characters you like in fiction or whatever uh, if mm-hmm. if one of them dies you just rename another one and turn them into ben merkel three i went through yeah. i went through two ben merkels before i, I, got I went through so one. many brayton twos when i played <laughs> darkest dungeon <laughs> like, you know it's a it, it, it's it's still a video game yes yeah so, so you can also do that <laughs> so let's talk about units yeah. Um, your staff roster of soldiers is, I think, your most important resource. Um, mm-hmm. Nothing else happens without this. You're going to be developing them over the course of several missions. They're going to rank up. As they level up, they improve their stats. Uh, you gain powerful skills at new ranks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are six classes in the game, and they have a, a signature skill that they get when they become a class. And then they have... A, Two sets or uh, two sets of mutually exclusive yes. skills. These lines that you choose one or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this system mm-hmm. in any video game. If I am making a choice between two things I want, mm-hmm. uh, I'm happy. Yes. In a, you know, in a game, it reminds me a lot of, um, I mean, a totally different genre and everything, but in Monster Train. Yes. You're going down that map and you can choose one path. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as I want both of those paths, that's a really fun thing to do. Yeah. You know, and, you know, picking one at the beginning doesn't lock you out of exactly. the other one right so you can you know craft it's not just like okay you've got to decide is, is this going to be a battle medic or is this going to be a combat hacker right yes. and you can you can mix and match um in addition to like their respec kind of things you can you can do later on but um you'll also have multiple copies of each of these classes yes you yeah. know so you, i i did a you know there are when i say you want them both there are skills that seem and are significantly better mm-hmm. you know that, that are no-brainers um i tried all of them though oh yeah because i had a lot of people to go through mm-hmm. you know and i wanted to see what they what they did and they did a good job of balancing these yeah there's gonna be turnover yes <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're gonna get so you're gonna get some write-ons like yeah, you're gonna get some hop-ons here you're gonna get some hop-offs in the, in the war <laughs> yeah so let's talk about these classes um grenadiers 
uh, all of these are new, right? Like in XCOM, Enemy Unknown, the classes were like Assault, Heavy, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. These speak to kind of more specific functions. Uh, grenadiers are your heavy weapon specialists. Uh, they carry machine gun cannons and grenade launchers. Yes. Uh, and broadly, there are two different paths are demolitions expert. Mm -hmm. uh, these are skills that improve your grenades and give you protection from explosions. And then heavy gunner skills, which uh, emphasize your cannon. Yeah. And make you a better support unit. Uh, mm -hmm. So your cannon will shred armor. You can lay down suppressing fire. You can highlight targets for other soldiers. You can destroy cover. Things like that. Mm -hmm. um, attack that uses all your ammo but can't miss. Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I found these. I had trouble using these early on uh, because the grenades that you start with are pretty weak. Um, have kind powerful of a, week. It, it, yeah, powerful weak. They have a small radius. But if you can upgrade those, these suddenly become overpowered. They're incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is one where I feel like uh, there were not very many heavy gunner skills I liked. Mm -hmm. I generally emphasize the grenades. Yeah. Um, and this, especially once you start getting different types of grenades. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing to their grenade. Uh, everyone can throw a grenade. Yeah. Grenadiers can launch it. So mm -hmm. their range uh, is increased. And that makes a really big difference once you start getting utility grenades. Yeah. And there are grenades that are also, there are beneficial grenades as well. Like mm -hmm. you can lay down smoke, things like that. They can do that at a distance. Yeah. Um, so it's a fairly versatile critter. Yeah. Basically anything they can put in that launcher will go real far. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Rangers. These are your short range uh, combat and recon uh, soldiers. They have a shotgun and a sword. Mm -hmm. um, the sword is really useful. It not only does really big damage, but there are certain enemies that are very vulnerable to it. Yes. Um, and if you, you can get a free movement if you use it at the end of your run. Yeah. Um, so back in XCOM 1, Using a melee attack was always a separate action. So you mm -hmm. could run once and then use it, but that wouldn't do anything. Right. Here you can run your full movement length yeah. and attack. Um, that does leave you exposed, but they get some abilities to ameliorate that. Yes. Yeah. Rangers just broadly, it's all mobility, right? Yes. Uh, the scout skill line will improve your stealth and ambush abilities. Um, this is mm -hmm. really powerful because you can stay in concealment longer and also do more damage out of concealment. Go back into concealment. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it, the, I, I found this to be really useful. The um, I ended up favoring the second one, the, mm -hmm. uh, the assault skills one. Um, this is more for direct damage dealing and making your blade really powerful, mm -hmm. um, largely because uh, there are a lot of enemies to focus down. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, especially in the second half when you start running into boss enemies. Yeah. Um, and then an ability that allows you to take attacks of opportunity if an enemy moves near you or moves from you, mm -hmm. um, which is the absolute key to dealing with the lost. Yes. Um, which we'll get to those guys. But once I figured out that combination that I could just throw this person in the middle of the lost and they would just kill all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, it was very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go, go do your thing, Michonne. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's literally that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next we got sharpshooters mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. these are your snipers they also get a pistol sidearm um, this is one that I had a little bit of trouble wrapping my head around thinking mm -hmm. alright snipers incredibly powerful in the original like this emphasis on short range combat as well like alright how do I get these guys to fit in basically it's you're either dealing a ton of damage at range um, you still get like squad sight right so you do not have to um, be right next to something or, you know, within your own line of sight to shoot something. If somebody else can see the enemy, you can see it as well. Or yeah. you get the ability to um, hit multiple enemies at closer range. Yeah, with your pistol. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, So the sniper's abilities do what you think, um, you know, make you uh, do more damage, um, give you height advantage, things like that. Um, you can take a shot on anything that enters your kill zone, <laughs> kill zone ability. Yeah. Um, there's a thing called serial, which refunds your action. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you kill somebody with your uh, sniper rifle and then gunslinger abilities that emphasize the pistol. Mm -hmm. So you can get counterattacks, free attacks. You can shoot everyone within your line of sight, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. This was one of the classes I mixed the most. Yes. Um, you know, because the, the pistol is not to be slept on, no. especially once you start getting unique pistols mm -hmm. uh, in the game, which happens relatively quickly. You can research um, some experimental weapons, get, you know, things like that. Uh, what is it? The shadow keeper. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that the cannot miss and will give you concealment if you kill something with it. It's wild. Um, Fucking yeah, wild. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't do, you know, damage drops off, mm -hmm. but by then you're moved on to you know, unique chosen weapons and shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got a lot of, uh, got a lot of mileage out of the gunslinger. Yeah. It's very good. 
Um, specialist, these are your support soldiers. Uh, they have assault rifles, so they can do, you know, fine damage on their own. But uh, what makes them special is their drones, which are called gremlins. Yeah, they got the grems. <laughs> uh, and the grems will run off and do our little remote action. Yeah. Um, all of them get something called aid protocol, which is really good. Um, grants defense bonuses to an ally who's out. This is the thing that is going to save your ass if you have to leave somebody out of cover. Oh, yeah. Um, this will help a lot. Or if somebody is very, uh, you know, very essential mm-hmm. and, and, uh, you cannot have them die really good for like VIPs, things like that. You're yeah. yeah. Um, and then they can hack things right out of the box, but then they're, they're two different wings, uh, either go towards, uh, medic skills or combat hacking. Right. Um, medic skills are really good. You get more uses of a med kit. Um, you can revive a range. Um, you improve your overwatch. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make your overwatch work regardless you know yeah. like the end of your turn no matter what you do and then uh it's penultimate ability is a heal all yeah which is really powerful in this game. oh my gosh like doing yeah. that right before you end a mission so uh your soldiers don't have to be in recovery for as long <laughs> so they i think that they still uh i don't know this for sure in okay. my experience without looking it up mm-hmm. is that the wound you take on a mission like you cannot heal a character who takes a wound on a mission and make them not be in recovery. Okay. If if somebody almost dies and you heal them up to full, they're still seriously wounded. Gotcha. That um, might have that just would, been superstition yeah. on my part. <laughs> I like to heal people at the end just so in case anything bad happened. Yeah. Uh, generally, this just happened a lot when I had to make a push for a timed objective. Yes. Like everyone's taken a hit because I have mm-hmm. to get to this place. I can burn this one person's turn and basically blank the enemy's last turn yeah by healing everybody it's also very useful um in kind of two-part missions multi-part missions oh, uh, yeah. like when you're going after the chosen and you have to do the little facility to find the warp pad like before i get everybody up on the warp i will use this um, yeah get everybody up to yeah up to just stuff. to refresh yeah yeah um and then combat hackers uh have the gremlin either do direct damage so that you do bonus damage damage to bots um you can scan the area uh and this is also what allows you to hack uh enemy units yes robots and turrets um this is ludicrously overpowered Mm -hmm. it is a risk reward thing you know if you fail it Mm -hmm. um they get a buff it's a that's a problem they need to be focused down but if you succeed it's huge yes um and as your character's hacking skill gets better um which you have some control over we'll we'll talk about that um you can uh make the low-level bots pretty easy to do yeah um it's worth noting in here like i did not save scum Mm -hmm. at all during this you're allowed to yeah. Um, but the, uh, it's not that I never saved. I would save from time to time. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, one thing I did save scum is because I wanted to control a, a sector unit, <laughs> like the, the giant mechs. I wanted to see what that, that was like. Uh huh. And I had a low chance. So I just kept reloading until I did it because I just wanted to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it fucking rocks. Oh, it's uh, great. It's, it's ludicrously overpowered. You get three actions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I love that they let you do it. Um, you know, and you can do the stand tall and just walk through buildings. Mm hmm. Uh, thing it's really good it, it contributes that everyone plays by the same rules no yeah. kind of feeling like we have a system with all of these things it's not just uh the, the same physics apply to everybody yeah if yeah. if you're you know if your people can mind control mine well before i get the ability to do that in return i at least get yes. to boss your robots around yeah i'm gonna take right? your, your fucking robot yeah a lot of times this is balanced around like a 60 percent chance yeah. of success which i think is really elegant yeah you know like it, it's worth a shot mm-hmm you know, it's it's worth a shot, but you're not going to get it every time. Yeah. But, but go ahead and try it because, like, it might save your ass, and when it does, it'll feel incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are the base ones, the base classes. There are two that are special and either higher up in the chain, like research chain, or um, uh, you need the DLC to get it. So uh, Psy Operatives, this is a special class that is opened up um, by researching psionics and building a special facility. Uh, these are like psychic mages who learn powerful skills to do damage or mess around with the minds of enemies. Yeah. Uh, I did not get one of these until the very end. Mm-hmm. of the game just because of the research path i ended up taking i didn't make a, a sci research lab mm-hmm. um and then when i did have it i didn't have uh low enough level characters to install into it yeah, uh, yeah. right away uh eventually got one but then i was at the end of the game yeah so but, other than like a, a hero unit you get uh near the end that does some of this stuff mm-hmm. um i did not get a chance to play with psychics yeah that's I got some psychics. If you do not, uh, by the time you get this, you're likely to stop just naturally getting rookies, kind of the undifferentiated raw material for soldiers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. However, you can always go to the barracks 
uh, or whatever one. it is, you can buy one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and then, yeah. and then train them up. It takes a long time to get a psi operative that is, uh, that is really good. Um, especially because once they become one, they only have the skills that you're able to teach them. Yes. Um, yeah. however, it, if you just like pick one, uh, you're essentially crafting a hero unit. Yeah, it seemed cool. Like reading mm-hmm. about them, their their abilities seem neat. Mind control is obviously huge. Yeah, and anything you know, being able to apply that uh, the hacking to organic units, I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, um, I just didn't it didn't work out with my my path. It wasn't mm-hmm. how my war went. <laughs> yeah, you know? um, but these broadly are uh, either like damage and debuffs, you know, damage and negative status effects, or buffs and mind yeah. control for for your people. Mm-hmm. And as far as I can tell, like the stuff that you get isn't mutually exclusive at different tiers. You can just, it just takes time to research them, honestly, or time to yes. train them in each of these. So, yeah, you know, it works a little different than the other characters. They don't just get XP. You just leave mm-hmm. them in the lab. Yeah. To learn things. Yeah. Um, um, what I did use a lot of are sparks units. And see, I didn't use these at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I had two, two big boy sparks Ooh. Uh, that, that were, were uh, my backup spark and my main spark. Mm-hmm. Um, these are your combat mechs. Um, super durable, uh, big damage dealers, um, but they have cooldowns on their abilities, uh, and they only, one of them can recover damage at once, mm-hmm. uh, and it takes a while yeah. uh, to do so. Um, they have two different, uh, paths, uh, future combat skills are kind of support oriented. Um, these are things that allow them to become cover, mm-hmm. um, for, for your creatures, uh, or for your, your characters. I don't know. They're, they're all chaffed to me. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't, I don't personify it's, any of these little shits. It's better not to um, get attached to the red shirts. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't, I don't do that. And darkest dungeon rules apply. <laughs> and then uh war machine that allows them to launch, you know, harder and wider hitting attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, the main reason why I really like a spark unit, other than the fact that, uh, I never felt anything if they got hurt and they're really durable. <laughs> yeah. Like they're hard to actually die. Yeah. So you send one out, and if it gets really hurt, you just don't get to send it out for a few missions, but then you get this powerful unit mm-hmm. a few missions down the road. Um, but is that they can use heavy weapons without uh, armor, Yeah, um, like that heavy weapon category. And the, the default one of these is rocket launcher, which is what it sounds like. It's just a good rocket launcher. Mm-hmm. But the other ones uh, that play with the um, kind of research experimental gotcha mechanic <laughs> in this, like, you know, gotcha pond mechanic, yeah. um, there's a thing called the shredder. Which does huge damage in a wide swath and shreds armor. Oh, shit. And I found really, really uh, necessary basically for any kind of like huge group of enemies, mm-hmm. but also for focusing down. Yeah. Um, at least with War, in the Cho- War of the Chosen, there are a lot more boss characters in this, <laughs> and I needed to be able to chunk a third of their health. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of my strategies were based around that between this and swords. Yeah. Um, I needed to get them off the board as soon as possible. That makes tons of sense. Um, you mentioning the become cover thing reminded me of another mm-hmm. thing about psi operatives. One of their most powerful abilities is just to raise up a piece of full cover that, oh, uh, that other people can use. So like just changing the geometry of the map in a, uh, pretty lightweight way is, is real good. Yeah. It makes it sound the way we're talking about it, it makes it sound like it's positioned as a choice between psi operatives and spark units, which no. would be cool. It would be cool. Uh, yeah, just, it's just not. You can just you can just research the ability to make sparks, mm-hmm. and you get them. Uh, but it would be a cool either or, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are hero units that we're going to discuss closer to the end of the game because that's related to the faction system, mm-hmm. um, which yeah. plays with the um, end of the episode. Yeah, at the It'd end of the weird episode. If we're like, it's the end of the game. It's finally say, time to see what Mox does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah sorry about that <laughs> no no, no. Yeah. Uh, um, so soldiers who are injured on the battlefield they're going to require rest to fully recover before they can be redeployed um mm-hmm. uh, you need to have a deep and balanced bench to succeed long term this is not something where you can have an a team um you're going no. to want to you know at the very least have you know four or five out of your six that are you know as high level as they can be and then maybe one or two slots for people who are trying to um kind of raise level up up. yeah yeah it's very similar to darkest dungeon yeah like you know an a and a b team and like a farm league will do well yes um and there are these systems you know other than just injury that that Mm -hmm. stop you characters will also get tired if they're deployed too often. And that's a big deal Mm -hmm. because they'll develop negative traits and negative traits, uh, again, very similar to darkest dungeon, (laughs) um, are, will make your characters act unpredictably. 
mm-hmm. um, will make your, your little creatures not do what you want them to do. Right. And these are awful. Mm-hmm. Um, things like panic or phobias for certain units will take your character out. will make them shoot your own characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like that. These are big deals. Yeah. Uh, um, most dangerous. They're going to run, but not for safety. They will just get in the, get in the open. <laughs> yep. Just you know, run forward. Terrible. You can eventually treat this again, very darkest dungeon, but you have to build facilities for it. Yes. Yeah. Um, with War of the Chosen, uh, the soldiers can develop bonds with each other, uh, pulling from Fire Emblem, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, as the bond deepens, they get better advantages when they're deployed with each other. Like the basic one is especially good. Like once per mission, um, uh, you get one chance to give either of them a um, an extra turn if they're close yes. enough to each other. Yeah, free action. Yeah. Um, and this is the, the base one. You have to actually build your base to be able to get the higher level ones. Mm-hmm. Um, this base one is great. Yes. On its own. Um, the risk here is that if a bonded soldier dies, the bond mate will have one of those negative effects, mm-hmm. either uh, berserk or panic. Mm-hmm. Um, these are two of the, the conditions you can get. Um, going berserk makes them attack wildly. Panicking makes them run for safety, both of which are things you do not want. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, when you deploy a soldier, you can customize them. You can choose their equipment. Uh, you research better armor. Uh, there are, uh, if, if it is just the broad basic armor that you improve, it's improved for everybody. But there are also like special armors you can get, either uh, heavy armor that you can put heavy weapons on or, uh, you know, light armor that gets, you know, cool little mobility abilities. Yeah, Crap. There's a bunch of different ones. Yeah. It, it plays into that gotcha. Mm-hmm. mechanic kind of thing we're talking about and it depends on your research yes after that. and these are limited and it's another reason not to have a soldier die because you can lose these yes um you know there's a risk to this it's one reason not to there's a little button that's like unequip everything uh-huh. so you can send every squad in with your best things mm-hmm. um but if you're sending in a squad and you're training somebody up and you don't know necessarily they're going to come back you're again doing this really interesting push pull do i want yeah. them to be more effective but <laughs> risk this piece of equipment yeah i put a lot of resources in the interns there's a fucking helium core in this i can't <laughs> those are hard to get yeah you know the interns share a pistol exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. um and uh in addition to this um weapons can be upgraded so you will find weapon upgrades out on the map typically from downed aliens um or as rewards for a mission and these are really really broad and very powerful yeah. Um, this will give you free reloads or make it so you always do scratch damage or get instant kills mm-hmm. or shooting won't take an action. Yeah. Things like that. Really, really cool things. But they can only be, uh, they cannot be taken off. Yeah. Once it's put on there, it's on there forever. <laughs> if you need to overwrite the slot, it will destroy it. Also, you know, if you put this on a gun and you get a better gun, well, sucks. Yeah. You yeah. Know? um the that uh the fact that like unequipping it will destroy it the uh research ability to undo that uh is Mm -hmm. ridiculously high up yeah (laughs) Yeah. i I imagine so because you would just put your best like near the end they were giving me advanced repeaters you know and advanced auto loaders that were very strong Mm -hmm. just having that on all my weapons would be really really powerful yeah those uh those repeaters are wild i think the advanced yeah. one gives you like a 10 percent chance to just do an instant kill on somebody yeah um uh, that procced for me with one of the alien rulers uh yeah. from the alien hunter dlc so like rather than having this like ultimate weapon that i had to chase around um mm-hmm. i just like i saw it and my first attack on it just murked it i was like all right well that's a problem solved again rules that apply to everybody right yeah yeah like that is that is a marker of good games to me mm-hmm. when you are doing systems and they apply to all the units on the screen rather than just being well this is a boss yeah. they need to be invincible that'd be undramatic mm-hmm. like you you can make your game work and just have it have internal consistency yes with that kind of thing yeah um there are also general bonuses you can get to your characters these are called personal combat stims or mm-hmm. sims rather um and these give really really strong bonuses you know like plus 31 percent dodge things like that um but you can only have one right on a character and again that's that's tricky because you life is cheap yes and xcom yeah so uh so that's people but those people have to live and get trained somewhere uh so now we're going to talk about base development uh instead of being like an underground bunker like it is in the original you got to be mobile um Mm -hmm. and in this case your base is the avenger which is a repurposed ufo uh that has been retrofitted to be a military base uh, you pilot it around the world to go on these missions uh, or like scan locations or build stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you improve this place. Mm-hmm. I mean, you do it and you improve your sh- soldiers by allocating resources gathered by completing missions. 
Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so you will uh, build these different facilities. Certain ones are default or are, are present by default. Mm-hmm. You know, so you always have a science lab, you always have an engineering lab, uh, and then like your quarters and uh, a memorial, things like that. Yeah. But then you have a little three by three grid of spaces you can use to construct additional facilities. Yeah. Um, you get a couple at the start, but like in uh, the first game, uh, most of them have to be excavated. They're just full of alien junk and they need to be, need to be cleared. This takes up a personnel resource. You have to allocate, allocate engineers and boy, are engineers rare in the early game. <laughs> yeah. What a miserable job that would be too. Yeah. Like it's just one guy. <laughs> you, know, you, you can you can usually with most things you apply engineers to you can apply multiples mm-hmm. to make things go quicker if you have an excess but you won't no yeah. initially but i just kept thinking about how sad it would be to be like i'm an engineer and then uh you get hired you know and the commander just makes you haul junk <laughs> for 12 days straight <laughs> you know up to sundown. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like all the all the scientists get to poke at dead bodies for <laughs> five, five days i just have to <laughs> lift things <laughs> Shit sucks. Yeah. Um, uh, clearing stuff takes time and then building stuff takes time. Like on the order of tens of, you know, 10, 10 days, 10, 15 at max, unless you, um, you know, staff multiple things. Yeah. Um, facilities have a power cost. So you need to de- dedicate resources to increasing that cap. Um, and you can do this by building generators and certain squares have power coils. So generators built there will uh have bonuses Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of the um like fallout shelter style synergies depending Mm -hmm. on placement um, yeah yeah it's not it's not emphasized uh emphasized like it is in the uh in the original like you know labs built next to each other or adjacent to each other here that is just around um uh one particular facility uh so like you want to build the generators or the power conduits on the spots with the power coils um but anything can be boosted if you happen to build a workshop kind of in the center so the workshop you can uh build drones that will deploy uh to the cardinal directions adjacent Mm -hmm. like in a plus symbol they can deploy to those facilities to uh act as engineers in those spots yeah it's one of the things that was simplified Yes. Um, from the first game, having this just be a three by three grid mm-hmm. um, and and for the most part, room for almost everything. Yeah. You know, like you don't get everything. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are things you will not be able to build, but you get most of the things. I like this as being a little bit streamlined. Yes. There. Yeah. Um, build order is important. However, even if you're ultimately going to get 80 or 90 percent of the, the rooms on offer, mm-hmm. um, you have to call your shots. Yeah. There. Um, and you need to manage your resources here. New facilities are either going to need engineers or scientists to staff them. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make them more effective by adding additional staff, and some rooms will still work mm-hmm. with nobody in them, uh, but they work much better. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, facilities can be upgraded, uh, which costs resources and basically your money in this, uh, and also increases the power cost. But upgrading a facility to make it more effective is much better than building a second one. Uh, yes. Something like uh, like the comms center or a, or a power a power conduit. Yeah. You don't have time or you don't have room. No. Nope. You, know, you don't have either of those things. You know, space is tight. You're scrappy. Yeah. Um, the uh, we mentioned the the placement bonuses have been taken away. Um, the science lab, which you start with, we have Dr. Tigus. Mm-hmm. Uh, he performs autopsies on alien unit bodies and, uh, little bits of tech, mm-hmm. uh, in order to unlock research projects that allow you to get new gear. Right. Um, super important. Mm-hmm. Um, you always need to have a research project going. Um, scientists do not get deployed the same way. There are a couple of things, ways you can deploy them, but for the most part, they all live in this lab. Mm-hmm. Um, so getting scientists are just permanent decreases to your research time. Right um you want to stockpile as many as you can Mm -hmm. go and grab them um the engineering lab is where you can direct uh the engineering director lily shen to to construct consumable support items along with new armor and weapons something that is great is for armor and most of the weapons uh you don't have to like make a new suit for each person uh it is just a broad across the board upgrade so uh, for the basic ones right um and then special ones you have to you know paid to have made and then deploy to individual people yeah this is also where your spark units get repaired yes um the uh the additional facilities we have fall under some broad categories here uh we have r d facilities um this includes the proving ground uh this is engineers that are staffed here will use kind of resources lyrium and lyrium cores to create unique items uh, through research this is the uh gachapon mechanic mm-hmm. i was mentioning so you will you will say um okay experimental heavy armor and you will get a random experimental ha- heavy armor mm-hmm. 
from this uh, that you then have and can deploy on one of your guys. It doesn't upgrade for everyone. Mm -hmm. You just have this toy. Yeah. Um, this is really good. Experimental ammo is really powerful. Okay. Um, experimental yeah. grenades are ludicrous. <laughs> um, you want to do these. Rush the frost uh, ones, please. <laughs> yeah. The frost grenades are really, really good. Um, giving anyone a timeout is just excellent. Yeah. Um, this is really, really powerful. And I like this randomization. Mm -hmm. of it. I like that, uh, you know, I got that end up rolling the, the shredder on my heavy weapons. And then mm -hmm. I was like, cool, that was really good. Do I want something else? And then I rolled the flamethrower and the flamethrower was not good. Mm -hmm. You know, I like that. I just happened to look out the first time. Yeah. Um, these are really cool. Not all of them are random. Like there are specific things that you research, um, in the lab that you can just order, uh, on it's, this yeah, it's the experimental one. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. if you click experimental, you'll randomly do it. But in the mm -hmm. research lab, if it says, Oh, you know, um, the, the heavy mech suit, or mm -hmm. whatever the the heavy suit that allows anyone to use a, a heavy weapon mm -hmm. you just choose to make it yeah i also like yeah. that you can queue these up yes yeah. yeah uh the laboratory uh this is just a passive bonus that you get it's a place where you can staff scientists uh to shorten research time but also improve the likelihood of getting breakthroughs um occasionally when you go to pick a new um go to pick a new research project there there will be a breakthrough or an inspiration and it is one particular research project on your queue that is chosen and if you choose to re to research it right now uh you get a um uh, a much shorter research time yeah the people are interested in that at yes. the moment um one thing i don't know where else to, to put this one thing i really like about this is the way that research times in general will go down eventually yes um every autopsy eventually becomes instant mm -hmm. um for you if like i ended up leaving a lot of autopsies even though they were good yeah uh, just because i was doing either story things or things that looked more interesting and they want you to have this stuff yes. by the end so eventually they'll just give them to you mm-hmm um, there are personnel development facilities, um, starting with the infirmary, this will reduce recovery time, uh, which is really important. Actually, yeah. um, you need fewer units if they're getting back into action sooner, mm -hmm. uh, there. And then, uh, this also allows you to remove negative traits yes. from soldiers, which is also really important. Similar to darkest dungeon. You don't want to suffer any of these, uh, these things that make your characters hard to control. No, no. Uh, the training center, this is where you can respec if you want to. Uh, you can gain mm -hmm. like advanced forms of new abilities if you would like. Um, and this is necessary to get those higher bond ranks between, uh, between soldiers. Well, and most importantly, this is the one that allows you to add extra slots. Yeah. Oh, no, that's the your... guerrilla combat. Uh, yeah, oh, the, the guerrilla you. combat center. I just, I forgot to include that. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's GCS. Yeah, yeah. That is where you add new slots and also where you can um, uh, research just upgrades that apply to every one of a particular unit, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you, like, all of your rangers do this. The new yeah. slots is the most important upgrade in the game. Yeah. Um, you know, bringing six people into a mission rather than four. Uh, is infinite. That's, you know, it's huge. It's 50% I mean, it's better. Yeah. It sounds infinite. I, you know, in terms of effectiveness, uh, it makes one of the biggest differences you can make. It, it compounds. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's, I would say, if anyone's going to play this, that's the thing to focus yeah. on first. Is getting yes. that thing. Yeah. Um, the, uh, we mentioned the, uh, the Psy Lab mm -hmm. uh, through this. It allows you to make rookies into Psy operatives and then develop their abilities. Mm -hmm. And then there are story and resistance uh, facilities. Yeah. Um, starting with resistance comms, uh, this expands the total number of resistant contacts you can have. Um, this kind of gates your expansion across the globe. We'll talk about this in the strategy later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is broadly a replacement for the satellites uh, yes. that you used to and, have. And as it's it's a carrot instead of a stick. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know the satellites were if you don't have enough, you will lose. Um, the resistance comms are it's better if you have more. Yes. Yeah. Um, the resistance ring lets you organize covert actions and resistance orders. This is related to the faction, so I put that stuff later, but this is the facility that you need to do that and do it more effectively. Um, yeah. The shadow chamber, this is like a story one. Uh, this is where you know, it's a special place where you do uh, research on really powerful alien artifacts and things like that. Uh, but also just having one uh, will provide intel in upcoming missions. So like you can see what the enemy team composition is. Yeah, and it ends up, this is a way of gating you from rushing through the game. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to have a shadow chamber up and running, and you have to research these things, so there's kind of a minimum length. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't just do the story missions in a chug. And then the worst one of all, uh, the defense matrix. Yeah. Uh, this gives you automated guns if the Avenger gets attacked. My Avenger got attacked once. Mm -hmm. uh, I had built this afterwards. <laughs> um, so I didn't even see this. And I never got attacked again. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I ended up building this because I was like, huh. Uh, and I wish I hadn't. 
Yeah, um, I'm going to give up 11% of my capacity for this eventuality. That never yeah. happened for me. <laughs> oh, you never got attacked? Nope. <laughs> it's a cool mission. It's yeah. like unbelievably cool, but you, yeah. it's stacked in your favor kind of regardless. Right. It felt like. So, like the the, um, the defending the XCOM base in the original game was a was a great mission. I love that. Yeah, it just never happened for me. <laughs> the, yeah, this is, this is similar to that. But the uh, I'll I'll just mention here because I don't know when it happened in my gameplay uh, mm-hmm. through. It's real cool. You're positioned by the Avenger. Uh-huh. You can't let enemies get on the the off ramp, and you have to destroy uh, an EMP generator across the map mm-hmm. while defending the Avenger. Yeah. And it's like stealth's time to shine. Yeah. Uh, you can send a, a stealth character. I can't remember the name of the uh, the hero unit. The Reapers. Uh, the health, yeah. yeah, the Reaper. Uh, send the, the Reaper hero unit over and just solo mission, destroying the EMP <laughs> while everyone else defends. Yeah. You also have to uh, deploy cool. two squads for that as well. Yeah. You uh, you deploy um, one squad and you get more characters okay. that get uh, get taken out. It's not a, a way in home team for that. Mm. It's uh, you get added characters as you go. Gotcha. Do that. Yeah. yeah um but yeah that this only happens if that happens it happened to you once and i played for a long time yeah so i wasn't trying to avoid it no so um zooming out uh we need to talk about the strategy layer and to do that we need to talk about time uh yes everything that you do from moving around to uh performing research scanning things requires time uh, scanning stuff will advance it. And as you advance through the calendar, each new month kind of ticks up the difficulty of the uh, units that you're going to be finding. So there's yes. kind of a pace uh, for the way things get harder. But everything is tied to the uh, will you lose the game meter, which is the progress on the Avatar project. Yeah, exceedingly uh, similar to a board game like mm-hmm. a doom counter on a board game. Um, I want to draw attention real quick to the fact that the time uh, of enemies getting tougher is static mm-hmm. um, as opposed to reactive. Yeah. Um, I think that makes this feel, uh, that's one of the, the bits of special sauce that make this feel special. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, is it's not reactive. A lot of times in a video game, when you're doing anything like this, you have all the time in the world because the opposition will only do things in relation to what you do. Yes. Um, example of that would be like, once you do story mission C in this game, mm-hmm. that's when the enemy uh, deploys uh, gateways. Yeah. You know, or something like that. Gatekeepers, rather. Mm-hmm. Um, not so. Nope. If you drag your feet in this, the the world will continue without you. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to actually, right from the beginning, you have to be careful. That's going to stress some people out. I didn't really understand this when I first started playing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, one of the things about this game is that I think that what we're doing in this episode is probably a better tutorial for it yeah. than, than the game does. I don't think it explains itself particularly well. Right. Um, I still <clears throat> did fine. The way this is balanced to put you under that pressure, but then make that pressure fun and mm-hmm. like doable yeah. is really intentional and masterful. I think mm-hmm. um, it made everything feel alive, made it feel like there were consequences. <sighs> and despite the fact that I had a sense, I was kind of fucking it up. I didn't get screwed. I was just steered into the fun zone. Yeah. All, uh, yeah. All, and the fact that it's a stair step means that like when, when you start seeing like an advanced version of a particular enemy, it's like, okay, <sighs> things just got a little bit more serious and then you direct and then you direct yes. your research, right? So maybe maybe that's what gets you to, you know, f- figure out how to get better armor because they're doing more damage, right? Yes. Uh, if it was just con- if it was just constant over the course of like a day counter or whatever, um, I could see that being a problem. But like, you know, see any time where we talk about stair step difficulty. Um, yeah, uh, you get diff- a month. Yeah, you get muton month. Yes. You know, it, it's Muton month. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you going to do for Muton month? Yeah. Uh, at, the be- at, at the beginning, you're going to be behind, but by the end of it, you're going to be ready just in time for something new to come up. Uh, yes. It is a way to maximize drama, but also um, maximize, you know, just the, the feeling of satisfaction of overcoming something. Right. And it feeds you yeah. new shit at a really regular clip. And it stops you from getting uh, complacent and turtling on the strategy layer. Mm-hmm. You know, like your uh, impulse and my impulse a lot of times in video games, you know, when you want to aim for optimal play mm-hmm. is to uh, like if I were playing Darkest Dungeon, it were just my choice. Yep. Um, I would upgrade everything in the Hamlet before I went out. Yes. You know, obviously you want to do that. That has systems in place to stop you from doing that. Mm-hmm. This is the system in place to stop you from doing that in this game. Yeah. Like you can't just hang out and research and scan things until yeah. you have end game armor because by then like the, you'll get outpaced. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's really elegant and it's, it's, I want more video games to do this mm-hmm. with their, with their difficulty. 
Yeah. Um, it, it leaves it in the player's hand. It be, the player has to be proactive Yeah. with this. It's not just um, uh, you take your turn, I take my turn mm-hmm. kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's borrowing from the world of board games in a way that is really good and interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that avatar project, like that meter is, it is not just, Hey, this fills up, uh, the game ends. What ends up happening is as it gets more full, uh, advent, the alien forces are, uh, kind of making things worse for you at a faster rate. So they're going to be building new facilities faster. Um, uh, like raids and things like that are going to happen in a bigger clip. Uh, there are Mm -hmm. things called dark events that are going to pop up that happen more frequently. Um, yeah. So it ends up being like an acceleration curve almost yes yeah. and if it does fill up you don't instantly get a game over mm-hmm. um it puts you on a month-long clock yeah uh, this is i got I, mine got to about six mm-hmm. uh, i think at my at my most um because i was playing conservatively to keep it down if i could mm-hmm. um the uh but reading about this it doesn't just like you know you're done mm-hmm. um you get a month to wrap up your loose ends yeah uh, or lower the avatar project yeah um <clears throat> you do that by sabotaging facilities um, or advancing story missions or through covert actions mm-hmm. um, through this. Uh, so that is another plate you're spinning. Yeah. Um, and it's not like terrible if you end up, you know, pretty high. I think I was a little bit less, um, a little bit less conservative than you. Like I wrote out like being two pips away from everything ending, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for, for a lot of my runtime and yeah, things get a little bit, a little bit more difficult, uh, but it is not, uh, it's not horrible. In fact, you know, if you're doing more missions, you're getting more resources and leveling up faster as well faster. as that yeah. stuff becomes more frequent so you know it, 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 there, there can be advantages to you know to riding at high and also like at any given time as those facilities were popping up uh you know and they're building more of them uh that's just more options and ways to uh turn the release valve and get that down uh if yeah. you end up you know if you end up needing to yeah and we'll, we'll talk about those facility missions yeah. eventually do because it's not just like a toggle you turn off like a lot of times you have to research them yes uh, things like that but it's just something you're keeping track of mm-hmm. you know so the the two twin things uh the enemies are always getting tougher and this meter is always going up mm-hmm. there um and you manage that through this kind of monthly rhythm that you do with the strategy layer mm-hmm. um and it's much more uh this is much more robust than the strategy layer of xcom one mm-hmm. um largely as a result of improvements made with war of the chosen yes um so the bridge of the ship that's where you go uh to see the world map uh, and it's divided into regions so continents will have like eastern asia western asia and asia uh, uh things like that and you want to make contacts with these um because uh that is going to a unlock uh new stuff to do new places where rumors are going to pop up but mm-hmm. also will improve your monthly income and unlocking new research or unlocking new regions uh, requires a secondary currency called Intel. I love that it's not just money because in a world where you are the government and um, everything is still functioning, you can just use money. That is a stand in for, you know, a bunch of different things as value is traded around. Since you are a resistance operating outside of the system, having it be, you know, related to or abstracted to resources like material things food. and it, yeah, food, yeah. yeah, food, scrap, metal, all this stuff. Um, yeah, you know, resources and intelligence, which is basically like influence and secrets that can be traded around. Uh, I think that is a really neat way for them to work this story change into um you know the the different changes that they made at the strategy layer right it does so much for the tone yeah like in in the first one you're working for the uh you know the sinister syndicate of the guy who goes commander Mm -hmm. uh and that guy's still around yeah but now he's a good guy Uh uh-huh like that whole time it felt like those guys were sinister x-files villains Uh uh-huh in the first one, I didn't feel good about them giving me money, you know, based on how many satellites I'd made. Uh-huh. Now it's like I'm getting money because I'm helping people of the world resist aliens. Yeah. You know, the, the fantasy of this is a lot stronger. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it, it just, it's very consonant with itself. It's scrappy uh, rebellion year here yeah. on W, here on Watch Out for it Fireballs. Feels good. Yeah. It feels good. <laughs> um, the, uh, so you make contact with these different regions. Um, if you get all of the, uh, regions within a continent, you mm-hmm. get a bonus. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, similar to your starting bonus, you know, in, uh, in XCOM one, mm-hmm. you choose where you started here. You just got to, you know, collect them all, yeah. uh, get, get all the pieces on the monopoly board mm-hmm. uh, through here. Yeah. Um, getting more of them gives you more money. 
and you can also deploy satellites uh, or radio towers. Rather. Yeah, radio towers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, that allow uh, that takes time, resources, but reduces the amount of uh, you know gives you more passive income and helps you get those bonuses. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get those bonuses and also m- the more radio towers you have out, the greater uh, monthly income you get. Yes. So, you know, you want to be deploying these like on the front in order to reduce Intel costs of reaching new places. But like if you have resources and time, you know, building more of these uh, kind of within the heart of the resistance can still, you know, be a, be an investment that pays off in the long, long run for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so as you expand your territory and you scan, uh, time passes, um, and you start getting this rhythm that mm-hmm. happens. You know, you get paid once a month. It's the first of the month, like Bone Thugs and Harmony said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then alien shit happens. Yes. Uh, on the first of the month, you get a supply drop. Um, uh, and this coincides with a meeting of the Rogue Council member, uh, mm-hmm. the Agent 47, who we talked to, mm-hmm. who evaluates you. If you enjoy being evaluated by a guy who goes, I had high hopes for you, Commander, and you have exceeded our expectations. <laughs> it's no Queen Latifah. Uh-huh. Like, there should be a mod that just has Queen Latifah pop up and go, gold rank, uh, <laughs> instead. <laughs> and I, I'd much prefer that. Yeah. Um, but you, you do get a shadowy, uh, bald man <laughs> telling you whether you're good or bad. Yes. <laughs> based on what you've done that month. Yeah. Um, instead of just receiving your payment there, uh, <laughs> they're going to drop some crates somewhere and you have to go and spend time, uh, uh kind of loading it up. Right. Yes. It takes about three days, but that is the way that you, uh, uh, that is the way you get the money, uh, that you need. Um, as time passes, you're going to receive resistance rumors. Uh, these are places where you can go and scan uh, in order to get supplies, get intel, um, find staff, uh, unlock missions uh, just to yes. see. Yeah. Yeah. And typically, um, you'll do these based on the reward. Yeah. These are kind of like community chest mm-hmm. pop ups. And like, this will give you an engineer, like, drop everything, go do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you they'll make everything else faster. Um, the avatar meter, as we mentioned, will continue to fill up. Um, Advent will construct new facilities that you're going to need to target that will, uh, that they're using to work on Advent shit. Yeah. Um, and they'll start instituting these dark events, as we mentioned more frequently. Um, yeah. dark events are permanent debuffs that make everything more dangerous. Yes. Um, the way these work is really interesting. Uh, they, they give you, there are three of them going mm-hmm. on. Um, one of them you don't get to see mm-hmm. unless you pay Intel and only one can be active at a time. Yes. So this is another, again, just really interesting strategic choice. There are ones of these that I always find tanking. Mm-hmm. You know, so I would be, you know, to be, I would get a choice of three of these. Two of them were basically fine, and mm-hmm. one of them would suck, and I'd be like, let it roll. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to spend my resources somewhere else because if this gets um, shuts off the black market for you know four weeks, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I can tank that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you're making again just everything being a really interesting choice. Yeah, what sets us apart? Yeah, uh, like oh, one of the dark events is that the chosen uh, of that area of the region that you're in might show up. Well, if yeah. I'm if I haven't learned who that chosen is yet, like how to mm-hmm. how, like how to counteract them, that might be really scary. But if they're just in a, a like a nuisance that I know how to take apart, so I can go about my business, uh, yeah. then fine, let it let it ride. Yeah. Or, or the ones that make the chosen uh, to come after you still pop up even after they're dead. Yeah. So it's like a freebie. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when these pop up, you get the uh, option for these gorilla ops. Um, you're presented with three missions, each of which will counter one of them mm-hmm. um, that is deployed in a month. Um, they all have different objectives, different difficulties, different rewards. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can, uh, with as you gain intel, um, you can see which enemies are detected at these things. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're basically making a choice, which uh, dark event do I want the least mm-hmm. or which reward do I want the most or which ones of these can I tank? Yes. Um, yeah. And this is where you get sit reps for the missions. Like these are always pretty difficult, uh, the missions mm-hmm. that you're going on, but like a very difficult mission whose sit rep, I don't I forget what mili- what that military term means, um, but these are like special conditions. So if the sit rep is um, uh, like there are a lot of explosives on this map, it's like, well, I can manage that and that might yeah, work out work in my that. favor. Yeah. Uh, the lost will be there. We'll talk about them. Um, the most devastating one of these is where you can only have three people. Yeah, the sur- surgical uh, mission. Yeah. Surgical mission. That's tough. Like the mission is balanced as such. You're not facing just a regular mission with half mm-hmm. your crew. Um, but having three, you know, having half as many actions is a huge deal. Yeah. I pretty much always turn those down. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I'll take the dark event. 
<laughs> um, the uh, time advancing introduces random emergency uh, missions. Um, some of these are resistance retaliations. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, some of these are things where they are turning against, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the resistance. They're going to come kill people and you have to save them. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you're teaming up with local resistance, which yeah. is very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes these are the local resistance found a way to hurt Advent and you attack their supply lines. Yeah. Uh, for this love, love scrappy. that shit yeah, yeah. scrappy <laughs> yeah. oh god if you can be anything be scrappy yeah um <laughs> um you can also at any time uh fly to the black market um and this is where uh it's like a shop where intel is your currency um good intel is how you pay but it's yeah. not what you get in exchange for selling Okay. Um, it's, yeah, it's really elegant. Um, yeah. Intel ends up becoming this weird resource that you can only get through missions and yeah. scanning objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and you can buy really powerful things from the black market with Intel, but they pay in cash for your corpses and shit. Yes, I forgot about that, uh, yeah. that, that difference there. I didn't sell an awful lot of stuff, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't end up. You end up with so many bodies. Yeah, like near the end, I have like hundreds of bodies, and I, I didn't have anything <laughs> to use them for, so I sold them. Yeah. But I also, at the end of the game, did not have much use for money. Yeah. Um. You know, I was building uh radio relays, but I was like, also, you know, I, I can finish the game now. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm, I'm powerful enough. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Something that is different. Uh. Something that's com com completely gone actually here uh is aerial combat that Thank was something goodness. that felt very perfunctory um in the in in the first game uh in enemy unknown uh it was something that you had to spend resources on if you didn't have air forces deployed then you know uh <laughs> invasions would happen like it was a way to stop them before they you know before before they came through uh mm -hmm. it sucked it was just you're watching a little uh plane figure move around a map and then you see health bars um yeah. guerrilla forces don't have jets they replaced it yep. with just like more interesting shit and more intricate s systems. Yeah, I'm really glad it's gone. Yeah, you know. Um, so the uh, as this happens, you know, the, the arc of the game as time passes and you expand, you reach this kind of inflection point where things go downhill for Advent. Yes. You know, you are on top of things. This happens mm -hmm. narratively and mechanically. Mm -hmm. um, and as this happens, you're getting these little flavor broadcast uh, after every mission. Typically, these are uh, propagandized accounts of what you've done. Yes. You know, uh, you go and save a bunch of people from being slaughtered. And at first it starts off like saying you're a terrorist, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, they're, oh, it was a un, unwarned attack. These people are trying to undo everything we've done. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it becomes, we've had to institute martial law yeah. because of the terrorism. Like their messaging <laughs> changes and it's really, really fun. Recruitment quotas have gone up. Yes. yes. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about the chosen because it is very hard to imagine playing this game without them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, these are elite alien human hybrids. Um, they're hunting down the commander specifically and each one was promised. It's like a, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, each one is promised. It's the rat race. It's right. Okay? Yeah. Please don't yeah. say, please don't mention that movie to me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, they've been promised to get earth. Yeah. Uh, once the aliens move on, if they, they beat you. Yeah. Um, one thing that is kind of a demerit to this game, uh, I love the tone and the feeling of resistance and stuff. I don't want to hear from the, these guys. I hate no, hearing from them. The warlock? Fuck it. The warlock, go to hell. I would step on the warlock's neck until the bubble stopped, like, if I could. I fucking hate listening to these guys. They have so much dialogue, and it's so bad. They speak so slowly. They, they speak really slowly. They're not funny. They're not cute. <laughs> uh, I don't, and I, I, when I looked at this, I was like, whenever I see a character in a game, uh, and I'm like, this, this fucking sucks. Uh -huh. Imagine if this guy came up to you, this fucking sucks. <laughs> I'm like, somebody wants to fuck this thing. Oh, and yeah. then went online and there are people who like ship them yeah, and yeah. stuff. And I just, it makes me feel alone in the world. Yeah. You know, like this is really mm -hmm. like these fucking guys, these collections of cliches, these, these, these lumpy, these, these, yeah, these lumpy cliches. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> give me a break. Like, I mechanically, could... I like all of them, yeah, but yeah. like word wise, these things can get fucked. Yeah. I, yeah. I hate them. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah. uh, fetishizing the chosen is le is is less understandable to me than people who like the hot snake ladies or whatever like that Very i can so. that, that i can understand these guys That's, know it, yeah <laughs> now it's like it's it's kind of like you know if somebody comes up to you and they're like if you had to fuck them up it which one would it be <laughs> and you're gonna say miss piggy it, oh, yeah, you know yeah. 
Because, like, of course, right? Yeah. Like, and, and I mean, I'm going to say that because I'm scared of Janice. <laughs> yeah. You know? But <laughs> I was going to correct you, but I didn't want to bring no, up Janice. No, I didn't want to scare scared you. I'm scared of Janice. <laughs> um, the, uh, but the thing about that is you don't just say that I'm prompted. Nope. You know, somebody comes up and asks you. <laughs> right? All these people who are, like, shipping the, the Chosen are just unprompted in the middle of the room to be like, I don't know, the Warlock can get it. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> No, yeah. do do yeah. do do whatever you want, but we can feel yeah. about it how we want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just it makes me feel alien. That's that's all you know, and not feeling alien like me feeling up the warlock. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, there's three yeah. of these guys, um, and yeah, this is a like this is a game of cat and mouse. Uh, yeah. Like over time, as they you know av- after you discovered them, made contact with them, you know every month, depending on how you you know how well you do in your fights against them and stuff, uh, they're they're, they're going to get like greater skills. Uh, yeah, they have like a level intel up meter. increases. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they level up. They can start sharing this intel with each other. That's one of the dark events. Mm-hmm. So multiple ones will level up. Yeah. Uh, things like that. And you have to beat them in a special mission. Um, you know, they can just show up randomly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have to do research and expend resources to find them to turn them off. Yes. Um, if their meter maxes out, this never happened uh, mm-hmm. to me, they will assault the ship. Yes. Um, which I, I did not have that happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, I just turn them off before that. Did you have them assault the Avenger? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and they also have a thing um, that is kind of gotcha uh, pilled where they have uh, random strengths and weaknesses. Yes. To this. Um, the way that this game in uh, incorporates randomness, I like a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause it's, it's most of the things that happen are deterministic, but you get little things like this that are just big plays. Mm-hmm. you know feel different like if yeah. i play this again you know the the warlock despite you'll know, still be a loud mouth but he'll have different weaknesses yes. and different strengths yeah like it, you know, there, there, there are three of them there, there are three factions like they will be randomly weak to one of the factions right yes yeah uh the, the assassin the warlock and the hunter and mm-hmm. these we're gonna talk about their their tactics next episode Yes. Uh, here. Um, and I guess they're fucking personalities. <laughs> um, there were originally going to be four of them because uh, they would correspond to the main soldier classes, but the fourth one was scrapped. Yeah. Uh, it was going to be grenadier coded. Right. Um, so, yeah, if you're doing a mission on their territory, there is a possibility that they're going to show up and ambush you. I love this. Uh, yeah. It feels a little bit like being invaded by somebody when you're playing a souls like. <laughs> like okay um i had a plan for what i was going to do here that plan is now completely out the window i need to deal with this emergency while also dealing with the stuff that's on the map Um, it was already basically an emergency yes (laughs) and uh and 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 deal with them and over the course of doing those you know doing those missions and you know dealing with those invasions you figure you figure out your tactics against them right yeah yeah eventually it becomes something you can take down Yes. Uh, fairly easily or you know defend against fairly easily regardless you know either one yeah um and the uh when you take them down they flee um you get skills for this um mm-hmm. there's a skill system for your special units which we'll talk about in the factions yeah. uh, how they gain abilities mm-hmm. um taking these out does give you a bonus but if you want to get rid of them forever you have to do these uh final missions you have to do these covert ops yeah um to find them and then storm their, their bases. bases yeah and you get a huge reward for that um, not only do they stop showing up, you get their equipment. Their equipment is very overpowered. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, also added in a war of the chosen is these factions. Um, this is something that uh, I think greatly improves the strategy layer uh, for this. Um, mm-hmm. So there are three of these. Uh, there was going to be a fourth faction of cyborgs who lived in the woods. Oh, uh, nice. I like I like woodsborgs. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, woodman. Woodman. Woodman's a cyborg. Yeah. Wood. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and they work on the strategy layer uh, and on the combat layer since these correspond to hero units that you can get from them. Uh, yes. They're going to, uh, you know, they, they, they can rank up, uh, but they like their skills. You have to spend ability points on uh, to, yeah. to get them. So, like, you're not making mutually exclusive choices between them, but you are using a limited resource that both the hero units can earn, but also there's like a shared pool that you can play from as well yeah and you can eventually with uh, the right upgrades in your base you can use these to give your characters bonuses as well use yeah. that shared pool mm-hmm. uh to get them uh, as well the um so there's three different types as we mentioned 
Um, the Reapers are these stealth commandos, uh, remnants of old special forces, forces uh, that would not submit to Advent. Yeah. Um, they're hero units, uh, and you get multiples. You get one that is kind mm-hmm. of named yeah. uh, initially, but they can die, and you can do missions to get bonuses or get yeah. uh, extras. Yes. Um, so they have uh, these special rifles, um, and they don't have the downs- the action point downside of a sharpshooter or sniper rifle. So it's basically yeah. a sniper rifle that you can use and then move. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't end your turn, things like that. Yes. Um, and they're stealth. Uh, they can remain concealed for longer. Um, taking an action uh, does not necessarily uh, make enemies see you. It's like a random chance. And the more stuff yes. you do, uh, the harder it is to remain concealed after doing something. Um, and they're saboteurs. They have a claymore mine that they can throw, uh, but also like you can give them an ability to just blow up explodable things in the environment and make them do more damage and have a wider explosion radius. Mm-hmm. Um, I love these guys. Yeah. They're really all three of these I ended up finding good use for. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely have, you know, uh, the Templar is my favorite, the next one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but these guys, these guys are really good. They can also hack those communication towers. Yes. Um, as we mentioned, and that is the first time I ended up doing that and seeing that like, Oh, I can actually do cool stuff with that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Templars, uh, these are escaped victims of Advent's psionic experiments. Oh, and the Reapers are Troy. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, Templars, uh, mm-hmm. who are John Delancey, uh, are escaped victims of the Advent's, uh, psionic experiments. Right. Um, they're, uh, you know, these religious zealots, they're very protoss pilled. I, yeah. I also noticed this, um, <laughs> and they have a unique mechanic. What's really interesting, uh, in multiple things in this, you see, uh, them, kind of test run things that were used in chimera squad and midnight suns Mm -hmm. um this is uh there's one of these you get in chimera squad Mm -hmm. as well uh that works basically the same way yeah um they have these psionic gauntlets and a submachine gun um and psionic abilities that are powered by this focus meter Mm -hmm. um they kill uh enemies with their gauntlets and they get a focus and then they can use this resource for things yeah um this ended up uh, being very very powerful uh they get a lot of um not only does that do a lot of damage, you know, the Sionic Gauntlets, but they get an ability where after they uh, use their Sionic Gauntlet, they can parry so they can ignore the first attack mm-hmm. that comes. Like, these are, you want them in the mix. Yes. Uh, yeah. These guys. Yeah, whereas the, you know, Psy operatives that you can get, they're more kind of squishy mage kind of folks. Yeah. 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 Uh, the last one here, these are skirmishers. These are former Advent soldiers. Um, who rebelled and removed their control their control chips, and these are like Klingon folks. Very, they're war- and they're voiced by Worf. Yep, That's Michael Dorn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, very aggressive alien human hybrid guys. Yes, um, they uh, they have a bullpup rifle. Uh, they can attack without ending their turn, and most of their skills are soldier like uh, and mobility. Yeah, um, they start with a grappling hook. Uh, then they also have a scorpion style get over here, or I guess I'll come to you uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Where they, I, I wish scorpion said, I guess I'll come to you. <laughs> That's the one change I would make in Mortal Kombat. Yeah, yeah, nothing else yeah. changed. Yeah. Yeah, should we take one car or two? <laughs> um, or should I follow you? <laughs> um, the uh, So they'll zip to an enemy and do damage um, or pull an enemy over. Mm-hmm. They don't have any defensive bonuses. No. On top of that, this is the one that fell off the most for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my mox ended up not being very useful near the end. My mox straight up died like the second mission. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, they, they're, they're not as, you know, they're, it's not as powerful as the other ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found skirmishers. The main thing I liked about skirmisher, skirmishers was the warlock was weak to them. Yes. So I could, I could hit him for a lot of, a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, factions and, uh, being in good with them, uh, open up covert ops. These are distinct from guerrilla ops. This fucking yes. infuriated me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, these are similar to the missions you'd send your characters to do in Final Fantasy Tactics. Yes. Uh, you know, while you send some characters out to do, uh, do some things for a reward, um, you get intel on the locations of the chosen, you get, uh, special equipment you know, things like that. Um, and then they have, uh, risks. So these can be mitigated by deploying extra soldiers or, uh, deploying resources. They can also be ambushed, Mm -hmm. uh, which means, uh, the chosen will show up and that character has to escape. You then control those characters and you have to get out. Mm -hmm. Um, so you want them equipped for those and it'll warn you. You Most of the time you can just send jobbers out of this kind of thing. Um, but there will be minimum levels Mm -hmm. for things. You can't just send out three rookies for everything. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a good way to level up 
people, actually, people yes. who are not ready for full-time missions, um, if there is no risk of being, you And know, uh, yeah. unique level ups, because they will get, uh, you know, this character will get one move. This mm -hmm. character will get plus 15 hacking for doing yeah. this. So you can level up and kind of craft your farm league yeah. from doing this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really like this system. Yeah. Um, yeah. The most interesting risk is that a uh, soldier might get captured, uh, meaning yes. that you have to do like other covert ops in order to figure out where they are in order to unlock the mission to go get them. Uh, I basically moved heaven and earth to avoid this yeah. you know, in terms of like adding resources. <laughs> they're fun I had enough on my plate. They're, they're, yeah. they're fun missions. I, I, I like those. I like the jailbreak ones. Um, yeah, I, I did a couple of them throughout the game, but I, I tried to avoid this yeah. because it was... It upset my month rhythm. <laughs> it's much. the it's the strategy RPG version of uh, having a turtle die and going yes. and, to that one level to get them back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, another benefit to this are resistance orders. Um, these are uh, there are four slots: one for each faction, and then one for the uh, shadow government guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are color coded. The resistance they give you perks. They're like yeah. ring slots. Yeah. Um, and you get them for the month. You can only switch them out once a month. Mm -hmm. um the shadow government guy can take any he's kind of a wild card yeah um these are also a, an element that is random mm -hmm. when you unlock these um and going and getting one you'll get a random pull some of these are very powerful yeah. um a thing that shaped my playthrough a lot is i didn't lose a lot of people to dying because one of the first one of these i unlocked was uh characters are much more likely to bleed out than die oh wow um so that was one of the i want to say it's a templar Mm. uh one but i got that fairly early on so i ended up with a lot of wounded through <laughs> my campaign um but did not end up with too many people dying yeah uh effectively is very similar because they just had to lay in the hospital you know for a long time <laughs> yeah. but uh depending on what you roll up um this can make a really big difference yeah i got a uh, i got one that shaped my run it, it made um contacting new regions instant Oh yeah. So it yeah. wasn't something that took time every time I I wanted to wanted to expand. I could use that time else uh, elsewhere. Um yeah. you know and that just turns into additional resources. Might unlock that eventually. Yeah. Um and there, 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 I got that one eventually. Yeah. Um there's a wide variety of these. Mm -hmm. Um and they're they're either go from very specialized like um you know 20% discount at the black market to combat things like as long as your team is concealed you get plus 3 move. Yeah. You know, things like that. Like, these are really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like the tension of only being able to switch them out once a month. Yeah. And it's a good um, it's a it's a good incentive to do covert ops in order to raise yes. your um, in order to raise your affinity with different factions, because the more they like you, uh, you can you can equip multiples on each of them. Yes. Um, yeah. you, get, you eventually get three link ring slots for each one. So you can have 12 of these perks mm -hmm. if you if you've powered everybody up. It's a huge advantage. Um, yeah. Something also that I didn't make a particular note of here but is a big deal is that the different factions have headquarters um mm -hmm. you um start with one i think for me i met the reapers first so i had yeah. a i had a place Riker. that i could yeah yeah i had a place that i could go to just like camp out and get intel uh if i if i wanted the other two factions you need to um spend time uh building their hq but once it's done you have a place to go and uh get like a pressure relief valve to get resources mm -hmm. Yeah, they're bonuses. Um, one of them makes you build things faster, and one of them heals your people faster. Yes. Um, through that. I think everybody starts with uh, the Intel one, mm -hmm. because Intel is kind of an odd currency Yeah. in the game. You can kind of end up... You, you're never stuck, because mm -hmm. you can always grind up Intel, but you get Intel from that pretty slowly. Yeah. Um, and if no missions are on board to give you Intel, and you're researching, uh, researching something else, you don't want to research like a data pad you found mm -hmm. to get Intel, um, it gives you a release valve for that. Yeah. I like yeah. how you pointedly avoided saying strange currency. Uh, yeah, I always do. Yeah. The, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that show's over. I, I forgot about it. That's the, uh, um, yeah. So the, again, just another lever. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's most of the levers you're going to hit. Yeah. Um, the individual missions, there's a wide variety of those. Um, and a wide variety of challenges. We're going to talk about those in the next episode. Yes. Um, for now, though, uh, let's talk about the uh, reception and legacy of this game. Yeah. Uh, so the base game reviewed and sold pretty well. Um, but there mm -hmm. were fans who were let down by some of the changes from the base game. I remember this. I was exposed to this through Dennis uh, on the yes. level. Uh, XCOM 2 is Dennis's favorite game. 
<laughs> like it, it's a great favorite game. Yeah, uh, even has, NS. Yeah, it has like completed the legendary Iron Man mode. Like here, like you know, just here recently. Like very good at this game. Has spent hundreds of hours playing it. You know, was a little bit let down coming from Xbox One coming to the base game, but. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, I got to see in real time Dennis's enthusiasm and the broader community, like the enthusiasm pick up when Word of the Chosen came out. Yeah, I, I can, I can imagine it. Like, absolutely. Oh. Um, the, uh, and, and I'm glad I came to this then. Yes. Right. Like if I had been, uh, XCOM pilled when this first came out, there's really no reason for me not to be, but if I had been when XCOM one came out, mm-hmm. I probably would have bought this Yeah, and I, I benefited from waiting. I, just like I benefited yeah. from waiting until enemy within, you know? Yeah, very much yeah. so. Uh, mod support's really huge for this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are new campaigns, uh, quality of life improvements everywhere. These are really fun to read about, even yeah. if I'm not going to have time to play them. Mm-hmm. Um, after this, Firaxis went on to develop XCOM Chimera Squad, uh, which we will do at some mm-hmm. point. Um, it is a all-hero unit breach and clear mm-hmm. uh, XCOM. Um, you never do the crawling around the map thing. It always starts right when combat starts. Yeah, um, It's really good. Yeah, I, uh... um, I, I think XCOM 2 is better. Uh, mm-hmm. like chimera squad is really fun the the main thing that is a little bit tough is the tone is goofier okay yeah which i which i don't like as much but the actual tactics like for access and tax tactics cannot fail nope like they haven't failed yet no so yeah. um after that in kind of a sideways move uh their most recent strategy game is not XCOM. it is a marvel superhero game called midnight suns Yes, uh, which I'll also do at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, I also really love that game. That is a tough pill to swallow story-wise <laughs> and dialogue-wise. But again, for access and tactics, uh, and it's real fun to play their lineage and see like things like The Lost yeah. in this, which we keep referencing. That's a, a specific enemy type that is added um, with the, the War of the Chosen update. Um, that enemy type is kind of pro- is, is prototyped here. For yeah. that. that is a more central mechanic mm-hmm. in Midnight Suns. Yeah. Um, Jake Solomon left for Axis after Midnight Suns underperformed and for Midsummer Studios and started development on a life sim uh, that expands on the life sim elements from Midnight Suns. Fuck me. <laughs> uh, I, I, under, I, I respect somebody wanting to try something different. Yes. You know, but it just, uh, I, I need more of this. I need him to play um, the hits, please. Yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah, just we, you know, nobody, nobody is really interested in this experimental world music thing mm-hmm. that, that you're doing, Brian, you know, <laughs> like, I understand it's cool and you're following it, but we just, you know, give me, give me the ambient works or at least the seventies rock. Yeah. You know, yeah. please. Um, yeah. And, and the, the future of the series is unclear. Yeah. Uh, no, no recent announcements, announcements or anything. We are just in this, uh, in this lull period. Can XCOM proceed, uh, without Jake Solomon, right? Yeah. I, I hope it does. You know, he's not the only person who can do tactics. Yeah. Uh, stuff, you know, other people can do it. Um, but I, I also just, man, do I want more of these? Yes. Uh, what a revelation. It sounds yeah. like we're wrapping up. We have to talk about the whole game still. We we're do have to do talk about episode. the whole game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're just going to do it next episode. Um, <laughs> but it, it, the, the structure will make sense once we mm-hmm. get into that. Yeah. Um, we appreciate you. We do. Uh, if you're listening to this and you are a marginalized creator and you'd like us to plug um one of your projects either products or projects um please let me know send an email to gary at duckfeed.tv uh this month we want to uh do a quick shout out to nat um sometimes in our jackbox uh Mm -hmm. streams goes by uh, special agent dale cupo oh Um, yeah i I love that username so much it's it's really good (laughs) um yeah um they are a, a person of color black person and a trans mask uh music teacher and they're raising money for gender affirming surgery Oh. Uh, via GoFundMe, um, the uh, the link we'll put it in the show notes of mm-hmm. this. Uh, GoFund, you know, GoFund dot me slash zero a six one eight four ce. You know, not super catchy. catchy. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> this is not how Go, GoFundMe works. Yeah, um, and they have a YouTube uh, music lesson channel at youtube dot com slash nat. Uh, that's n a t nat quick music. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, check that out. Throw throw somebody help uh, help nat out. Yeah. Um, send me a link uh, to that so I can so I can get it included in the uh, in the show notes. Yes. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what else should they do? Well, if you have thoughts about XCOM 2 or Super Baseball 2020 or Illusion of Gaia, the deadline for those responses is August the 15th. Uh, go to duckfeed.tv slash contact and write in. Um, there, if you have thoughts about multiple games, separate them into multiple responses. 
uh, Mm -hmm. and trying to try to keep them um, concise and specific. Yeah, we would appreciate that. Um, Also, if you have thoughts about next month's games, uh, write in by the 15th of September. And those are Super Bomberman 2, City of Heroes, and Fables 2. If you want to play City of Heroes with us, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll Uh, have uh, that info up. I can can tell you, um, we are on the Excelsior server. Uh, is mm-hmm. uh, is what that is what that's called. Um, and we do not have a super team yet. You have to be level ten to start one of those. I'm working on that. But if you want to add my character as a friend, my character's name is Vapor Shock. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's uh, just I, Vapor Shock. It's just Vapor yeah, Shock. It's vapor, vapor. Yeah. It's just Vapor Lock. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah. yeah. I have not uh, uh, signed up yet. Oh, but oh we are doing the um, the City of Heroes Homecoming. That is the version that runs on modern systems, and it is the officially sanctioned fan server uh, is what that is. So just yeah. do a search for City of Heroes Homecoming. It's free to play. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, of those, uh, Illusion of Gaia and Fable 2 are both premium episodes. That means everybody's going to get the generalities, but patrons will get the play-by-play. Mm-hmm. If you'd like to become a patron uh, and get those, go to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv, $5 a month. Uh, get you that exclusive episode tons of other shows like too many to list um, mm-hmm. we, we put a lot of stuff um check it out yeah uh, we like uh, to think it's a good value if you've already done that or can't do that another way to help is to rate or review us uh or subscribe mm-hmm. in your podcast directory of choice um and help spread the word post about us on social media share our social clips all of that is there for you all we have is your word of mouth yeah, we really appreciate it. And uh, join us in thanking our producer, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, until next time, what should they watch out for? Uh, until next time, watch out for my Reaper. He's going to get you.